just want to do a quick introduction before we get started. I um, want to say thank you for joining us for the Montana Solar Schools uh, Feasibility Webinar. Um, we're excited to share the project with you. So again, thanks for joining us. Um, can you go ahead and please mute yourselves if you have not already done so? And also turn off cameras. I don't see anybody's camera on, but if you do have it on, if you wouldn't mind shutting that off. Um, and I'd like to let you know that the webinar is being recorded um, and we'll be able to share that um, after the webinar if you'd like to see it. Um, I'm just gonna make a few quick introductions before we get started. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce us from the Energy Office. Um, there's myself, Robin Boyle. I'm the Smart Schools Program Manager and Clean Energy Financing Specialist. Uh, next, we have Ben Rauer. He's our Energy Planning and Renewable Section Supervisor. Um, we also have Miranda Bass on the line. She's the Alternative Energy Revolving Loan Program Manager. She's also helping out with technical assistance um, during the webinar. And we also have Jasmine getz Mullen. She's our Smart Schools Coordinator and our Energy Corps member. Um, along with the Energy Office, we also have Ted Redman from Pale Blue Dot. He's the co-founder, and he was also our project consultant for this particular project. We also have Rich Parker from the Bozeman School District, um, and Rich is the Building Systems Energy Manager. He also is going to be talking to us later about the Bozeman School Solar Project, so we're excited to hear from him as well. Um, and then others that are on the webinar that are tuned in today are schools that participated in the feasibility study. Um, there's also solar installers on the line and EPCs, energy performance contractors, and I'm sure several others. So we're looking forward to hearing from everybody. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to note that after each presentation, there'll be time for questions. We'll give a couple of minutes um, and you can go ahead and use your chat boxes for that. Um, and then at the end of the entire webinar, we're gonna set aside about 30 minutes for some good question and answers. So there'll be a, a Q and A session. Um, yeah, like I said, please use the chat box feature to enter any questions you may have, and we'll definitely be sure to answer those for you um, the best we can. So let's get started. Uh, first up, we have Ben, who's going to talk about the SEEDS grant and give us a quick Solar 101. So thank you. Morning, everyone. Uh, ben Brower here. Uh, go ahead and let's skip to the next slide there. Um, so I just want to echo Robin's thank you all for joining us. We've got a good crowd. Um, and I'm excited to share the project that we've been working on over the last, uh, well, about half a year or so. Um, the school solar feasibility study that we're going to focus on today um, was part of a larger project. Uh, the uh, DEQ's Energy Office received an award in 2017 from the U.S. Department of Energy to assess options for expanding community scale solar in Montana. Uh, the project ran through the end of 2019. For the purposes of the project, we define community scale solar to include uh, solar projects in which multiple utility customers sign up for um, or subscribe to the output from a single solar array. Uh, we also work to expand solar sited on community owned facilities like schools. Um, obviously we'll get, get into the detail of that work in a little bit. Uh, the project also worked to expand community efforts um, to support residential and small commercial solar installations such as uh, bulk solar buying projects. The project overall, the Montana Solar Community Project included market assessment, a series of stakeholder meetings around the state, um, community scale solar menu of options report. Uh, we also provided a number of project implementation support grants. Those were feasibility um, studies at a, at a fairly detailed level for solar on low-income housing in Whitefish, a community solar project on Beartooth Electric Co-op, um, engineering and design for a school solar array in Bozeman. And then uh, we wrapped up the project with this school solar feasibility study that we're going to talk about today. Um, as as uh, I'm sure many of you are well aware, there's a lot of reasons that schools look into and consider um, adding solar uh, to their facilities. And for a variety of reasons, uh, potential cost savings for the school, uh, curriculum integration, reduced uh, emissions from the energy use of the buildings. Um, a lot of schools also have a, a big roof and, and have a fairly convenient place to, um, to actually build a solar array. Schools also run into a lot of similar challenges. Um, 
many of these projects do require grant funds to make them financially appealing to schools. Uh, most of the school solar arrays that we've seen built around the state have, um, have been built with the support of their electric service provider, whether it's a co-op or whether it's Northwestern Energy. A lot of the projects that you'll see in, uh, in snapshots, pictures throughout the course of this presentation have been funded by Northwestern Energy customer funds through their E-plus renewables program um, or other funds. So uh, the goal of this school solar feasibility study was to provide a high level um, initial review of solar options for a whole bunch of schools. Um, it's important to understand that given the nature of this desktop study, uh, the cost and the savings estimates, while they're good estimates, um, may vary um, significantly depending on actual structural or electrical requirements that um, an individual school might be faced with. So before Ted Redmond walks through the study methodology that he designed and implemented in this, uh, um, in this review. I'm going to go ahead and touch on some solar one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I know just looking at the um, list of attendees that this is going to be uh, very basic for some of you. Um, for others, I hope that it uh, gives you just a, a, a few of the terms and, um, and concepts that uh, are worth understanding as you delve into solar on your school. Um, just a quick run through of the list of schools. Um, as you can see, there were a bunch of schools included in this project, um, 13 districts, I believe, all together uh, with multiple individual facilities. So we had great participation in the project. So let's go ahead and jump into the Solar 101. Go ahead, next slide. So just to start off, how does solar, uh, how does a solar panel generate electricity? A solar PV, photovoltaic, PV stands for photovoltaic. Um, essentially, the sunlight is knocking loose electrons from the silicon wafers in the solar panel. And as it knocks those electrons loose, um, it creates electrical current that flows, um, that flows into the electrical system of the building on which the solar array is mounted. Next slide, please. Few important terms that you're going to run into in this work. Um, first off, watt um, is a unit of power, and I should point out that it's a unit of instantaneous power. Um, the solar industry, the capacity or the size or the generating capacity of a solar module or a solar panel is defined in watts. Um, for example, you might have a 300 watt solar panel that will generate 300 watts of power in ideal conditions. Um, kilowatt is another term you're going to hear a lot. Um, also, it's a unit of instantaneous power. It's simply 1,000 watts. Um, uh, oftentimes, the, the size of a solar array on a, on a building is defined in kilowatts. So you might have a 6.5 kilowatt residential solar array that would be big enough to generate oh, about 9,000 kilowatt hours in a year, which is roughly equivalent to the um, average electrical, annual electrical consumption of a typical um, uh, homeowner in Montana. Um, at the larger scale, you might have a 50 kilowatt array on top of a school that would generate in the neighborhood of say 65 or more, uh, 65,000 or more kilowatt hours in a year. Uh, maybe not enough to suit the needs of that whole school, but just wanted to give you a sense of scale. Again, kilowatt um, being the term there to define uh, the capacity or the size of an array. Um, another term that you're going to run into a lot is kilowatt hour, and this is probably a term you're familiar with from your power bill. Um, we are typically billed in kilowatt hours of energy that we use. So a kilowatt hour is a unit of energy to use of power over time. Um, and, um, and in the course of this discussion today, you're going to hear about how many um, kilowatt hours a solar panel or a solar array is expected to produce over the course of a day or a month or a year. Um, when we're talking about um, the electrical um, energy um, coming off of these solar panels, we'll talk about it in DC or direct current um, and alternating current. Um, DC direct current is, is what's coming out of the solar panels. Um, our buildings, however, use alternating current. Um, and so there's an important step between um, the solar panels, an important component between the solar panels and, uh, and, and, the, and the, the building on which it's mounted or the electrical grid, and um, that's the inverter. Let's go ahead and skip to the next slide, please, Robin. So the components you'll see in a typical solar array setup 
um, that's attached to the grid. And I should point out that all of what we're going to be talking about today is grid-tied um, solar installations rather than off-grid systems that would have a battery um, and store their own power. Um, typical components in a solar installation would be the, the panels, um, the inverter, number two there, um, which converts the DC electricity to um, AC alternating current that can be used in, in the facility. Um, power that comes out of the inverter is going to feed directly into the service panel of that um, facility. Um, and then it's going to run back through uh, the meter uh, uh, and then from the meter out to the utility grid. Next slide, please. A little bit more detail about uh, terms here. Um, a single solar panel um, is also known as a solar module or a PV module. Uh, multiple photovoltaic cells are what make up that module or that panel. Um, and a, a, a compilation or a bunch of these different solar panels all together is, is, is referred to as an array. Next slide. You'll see solar um, arrays mounted in a, in a number of different ways. Um, and you know, depending on your school, you might consider any of a variety of different approaches to mounting an array. A flush mounted array um, is fastened. Uh, the, the solar panels are attached to rails. The rails are attached directly to the roof. Uh, tilt rack mounted system, um, as you can see, has a, a racking system that tilts it up um, to a, a more optimal angle to face the sun. Uh, pole mounted systems are an option for ground mounted systems. Um, uh, all of these have their own um, pluses and minuses. All of these have their own um, uh, scenarios where they're useful or, or not so useful. Um, and some will be cheaper than others. Um, typically a flush mounted system um, is going to be the most straightforward. Um, obviously, the more racking equipment that you add, <clears throat> or the more pole mounting equipment that you add, um, the more infrastructure costs that you're going to be dealing with. Next slide, please. Yeah, and this is Robin. We had a request for you to um, maybe speak up if you can. Oh, okay. See if this helps. Next slide, please. A couple of uh, typical roof mounting systems that you'll see on a flat roof. Uh, one would be uh, mechanically fastened, and we just looked at a couple of mechanically fastened types of systems, typically on a rack that tilts the array up. Um, another approach is what's called a ballasted system, um, in which the system is not actually mechanically fastened to the structure. Um, the array is um, attached to um, uh, these ballasted or weighted um, um, uh, components that keep the solar panels from blowing away in the wind, essentially. Um, a mechanically fastened system on a flat roof uh, will require more flashing to ensure that the roof penetrations don't leak. Um, so maybe a little bit more complicated on the front end in terms of installation. Um, a ballasted system doesn't require roof penetrations, um, um, so maybe a little bit more appealing in, in, in some regards. Obviously, the um, weight has to be able to, or the roof has to be able to accommodate the extra um, extra weight of the of ballasted system. So there's trade-offs with a, of each of these different approaches. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, a really critical component in these systems is the inverter, which converts the DC electricity coming out of the panels to the AC um, uh, electricity current that we can use in our buildings. The inverter is really the brains of the operation, if you will. Next slide, please. Most, uh, just about all, um, solar installations also have some sort of a monitoring system um, that, that you'll be able to view um, on a desktop or on a phone um, that will be able to track the output of the system um, it may be something that you can integrate into your existing facility energy management systems. Um, and obviously, this is where you start to think about what kind of outputs you would need in order to um, integrate solar into a, a curriculum, science curriculum for your school. Um, but these are all the, you know, the, there's a lot of different options here in terms of, um, in terms of how the information from the inverter um, gets to this monitoring system um, and then ultimately 
ultimately what the display looks at will usually depend on the inverter um, and the uh, component package that you're using for your installation. Next slide. One important uh, concept to understand, um, as I mentioned, the solar installations that we're going to be talking about that we um, considered in the course of this um, in the course of this uh, feasibility study are all <coughs> grid tied um, solar installations. So the uh, the um, the school would remain connected to their electric service provider. In order to remain connected to your electric service provider and um, install solar and be able to utilize that solar, you're probably going to be um, you're probably going to be under what's called a net metering agreement with your utility. Um, and what that allows for is for a facility, a home or a school uh, to generate electricity from their solar panels. Um, and as I explained earlier, the solar will, will first serve the, the load at that facility, whether it's the lighting or the HVAC system. There's, um, first, it will go to serve that on-site load. Um, if there's excess power at any given moment, um, that electricity will push, be pushed backwards through the meter, if you will, um, and onto the grid. And a net metering agreement simply allows for the utility to count up the number of kilowatt hours, um, the amount of energy um, that this facility is pushing back onto the grid. And, uh, and then under a net metering agreement, the customer receives a credit on their bill for excess electricity that is um, generated by that facility. And typically, it depends on your utility. Um, you would see those credits carry forward on your bill from month to month um, with an annual true up date. And so if you have more electricity, if you're generating more electricity than you actually use over the course of the year, um, at the end of that 12-month billing cycle, your, um, your bill is going to be trued up and you're going to lose those excess credits. Um, under a net metering agreement, you're not actually getting paid for the power that you're generating. You're not going to get paid for the excess power that you're generating. Again, it's simply a kilowatt hour credit um, for, uh, um, for the excess power that you generate and push back onto the grid. Um, you're still going to be paying your fixed monthly charges. Um, uh, net metering agreements typically don't allow you to um, reduce your demand charges um, with the credits from your from your bill. Um, so you're probably still going to be paying demand charges if you're a school facility and those fixed monthly charges as well. Um, it's also important to note that net metering in Montana varies um, by utility, by electricity service provider. I know we have a number of schools involved in this study across uh, a number of different electric service providers. Um, um, and it's important to touch base with your um, your utility, make sure you understand what the terms of their net metering agreement are, um, and that it's going to work. You know, it's going to work for both of you, the system that you're planning. So that's all for me. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, take a couple of questions now, if there are any. Um, again, please go ahead and submit those questions through the chat box. Any questions at this time? We've got one question from Chelsea Cardo, who says, hi, Ben. Can we go back to the participating school slide for a moment? Sure, we could run back there. Oh. There we are. So as I mentioned, a bunch of different districts and um, uh, around, the, around the state, um, pretty good geographic distribution. Um, and a mix of high schools, elementary, middle school um, facilities. Looks like there's a question from Pat. Question is whether it's possible to reduce demand charges. Um, great question. And, um, and we're going to let Ted get into that in a little bit more detail in terms of the results of what what uh, or the assumptions that we used in this this feasibility study and, and the results that we found. Um, 
and yes, the, the there it is possible to reduce demand charges um, for um, for uh, for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with what demand charges are. It's an important piece of the electric bill for um, most schools. Um, they're going to be billed um, based on the energy they consume, so the kilowatt hours that they consume. Um, they're also going to be billed based on the peak uh, the peak uh, demand the peak power consumption over the course of that month, um, and if that peak demand happens to coincide with a time when the solar array is generating electricity, um, then it will reduce that peak demand over the course of that month. Um, with you know with schools, um, you're probably going to see peak demands during daytime hours. Um, and there may be months over the course of the year, several months over the course of the year, where your solar array is going to be generating electricity and therefore reducing your peak demand usage um, at a time when you otherwise would be peaking. So, um, yes, I, th I think it is feasible to assume that we could um, see some demand reduction from, um, from a solar installation on a school. And as I mentioned, Ted did build that into the assumptions that we used for this feasibility study. Um, just an important clarification, as I said earlier, um, if you have excess credits with your net metering um, agreement, those credits, um, as far as I'm aware, there aren't any utilities in the state that would allow those credits to be used towards reducing your demand charges. Any other questions? Okay, let's go ahead and switch over to Ted then. Morning, everybody. Uh, so I'm gonna start off, talk a little bit about uh, project methodology and then uh, some of the content that's in the report. Uh, why don't we go ahead and start on the next slide, please. So uh, we started off the project with a brief questionnaire that was sent out to each of the schools. Uh, we collected basic information like the size of the subject site, the building size, uh, population, number of uh, students, building age, roof age, et cetera. Um, and we also asked for a full year's worth of electric uh, bills. Uh, all of that information, then we can begin our uh, concept study. Next slide, please. With that uh, uh, compiled data, we also created a uh, comparison, a peer comparison for all the peer group uh, schools involved, where we looked at the total electric consumption uh, per square foot of building as well as uh, per student. Um, and those numbers, uh, those peer group numbers are also included in each of the uh, sites reports. And we are providing that because we find, although comparing against other sites is not always 100% useful, uh, it does give a sense as uh, in terms of where your school might fit. Um, and as we've talked about, we did include a comparison of demand charges. Um, and next slide. And the reason for including uh, demand charges is, as uh, Ben's talked about, uh, demand charge plays a very uh, critical role in the cost effectiveness of solar arrays. Um, we talked about how uh, you pay for a demand charge in addition to your electric consumption. But there's a flip side, which is also you usually pay a smaller cost per kilowatt hour if you are on, are on a tariff that uses a demand charge. Um, so what that means uh, for a solar array is because under a net metering structure, we're getting to uh, offset each of our um, kilowatt hours consumed uh, with kil kilowatt hours generated on site. And that's kind of a one for one exchange. If I pay 10 cents for a kilowatt hour uh, off the grid, and I generate a kilowatt hour, I'm gonna get 10 cents for that. But um, with demand charge uh, tariff rates, usually we're paying a lower cost per kilowatt hour. So it makes the cost effectiveness, it's a tighter sort of margin for uh, solar arrays. We also include it because being aware of your demand charge is very important. Uh, there are strategies to reduce your demand charge. Uh, as Ben talked about, there is the potential to uh, mitigate some of that uh, demand charge through solar arrays. It will not erase them, but it may mitigate them some, and we've included some estimation in there. 
But there are other, are other strategies, uh, such as uh, load balancing and other peak shaving strategies, where we, if we can reduce down the amount of energy that we're consuming uh, when all the machines turn on at the same time, if we can uh, balance that, we can reduce some of our demand charges. So there are strategies out there. We just wanted to make you aware of it. Next slide. So uh, we also reviewed all of the net metering policies uh, for each of the utilities in the state of Montana. Uh, the electric utilities are allowed to set a maximum size for the solar array, and uh, each of them have for the uh, districts that we're looking at. And so some uh, utilities have a 10 kilowatt uh, array maximum, others have a 25 kilowatt, and uh, yet others have a, a 50 kilowatt uh, maximum allowed under the net metering. So each site uh, has, uh, the arrays are sized right up to that maximum. If appropriate, there may be some sites where uh, that maximum is, is even larger than what was needed. But um, in general, that's the, uh, that's the regulator for how large these arrays are, is the maximums uh, provided by the utility. Next slide. So then our next step was to conduct a remote site uh, conditions review. So there we're using the uh, uh, satellite data available, um, uh, photographs and such, and we're looking at uh, the ground, general surroundings, uh, what's around the schools. We're looking at uh, what sorts of solar obstructions might be there, things like the site's landscaping, uh, whether there might be landscaping, which could cause a solar obstruction. We're also looking at overall building configuration, uh, building orientation, roof design, uh, roof materials, as best we can tell, um, equipment locations, um, and trying to determine what the most appropriate location for an array may be. Uh, so in addition to satellite images, we're also using uh, Google's uh, awesome uh, street views to get a good sense uh, of what the surroundings look like and the building looks like, as well as uh, Google, Google Earth views. Next slide. Um, so the site uh, conditions which might impact solar arrays were then modeled uh, in uh, a modeling software that we use for uh, solar array design. Um, and the modeling of the site, site obstructions uh, within the solar path include, as I was saying, landscape feature, features, uh, site structures, structures on adjacent uh, properties. And we could then model those to determine the level of solar obstruction. In other words, how much shade or shadow that those obstructions may cast on a, uh, the array area on an uh, hourly by hourly basis, actually, year round. So it's modeled uh, for every, every hour of the, the uh, day. Next slide. Once uh, appropriate array, uh, array locations were identified, uh, the roof conditions were mapped and modeled. So the rooftop mapping included uh, looking at code required uh, access, uh, rooftop equipment, uh, roof uh, levels and height changes and uh, angles that might exist, uh, as well as maintenance pathways and access. And basically that then establishes the boundary uh, for the array, or the possible boundary for the arrays. Uh, we then uh, did obstruction modeling, which included year-round shade and shadow projection and calculation of uh, electricity generation uh, impacts. And then the modeling of the rooftop equipment establishes uh, the level of solar obstruction so that the array's performance can be accurately modeled. Next slide. So once the uh, conditions are arrayed, uh, we uh, uh, created design concepts. Uh, with uh, specific panel selections and inverter selections and material selections, um, as well as uh, site-specific tilts and orientations uh, that would maximize uh, overall efficiency uh, for the year. Um, and then uh, through the modeling software, we produced a uh, shade modeling to calculate on an individual panel basis, uh, the performance for each panel. And then panels that were not uh, meeting sort of a reasonable threshold for efficiency were then eliminated uh, wherever possible in order to improve the overall uh, array efficiency. Next slide. With all of that done, we then generated uh, a full uh, generation report uh, for each array. 
And not only does that include the solar obstructions that I've just talked about and how much sunlight is actually hitting each uh, portion of the surface, surface but also um, uh, uh, site-specific climate data from NOAA, uh, local weather stations. And so that means that the model includes uh, averages for uh, average hours of sunlight, uh, rain, snow, cloud cover, all the sorts of things that we get uh, on an annual basis. So then uh, the report includes a, a performance modeling, uh, which includes uh, system electrical losses, which are a normal part of any electrical system as we have uh, le uh, electrical connections through materials, we lose some, uh, as well as uh, shade and shadow, as I've already talked about. We also uh, project out monthly electrical uh, production, uh, detailed pro uh, projection of annual uh, production, and then a summary of the system, which includes the name nameplate size, the uh, DC capacity and the AC capacity, number of panels, uh, number of inverters, et cetera. Next slide. So once the uh, uh, array concept design is complete, uh, we've developed a, we develop a detailed cost estimate. I'll wait for that to come up here. And so the cost estimates are uh, based on uh, recent regional market cost reports, but then are also adjusted for uh, local uh, cost indice uh, studies, uh, state by state, as well as national um, uh, cost uh, indices put together by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So it's a mixture of what we're seeing nationally tweaked with local uh, indice projections and then verified against uh, recent uh, bids. Um, and these estimates are put together in a, there's a few categories. The first is administrative costs. So there we, uh, we tend to put in anything that the owner might, uh, might have to pay for outside of hiring a contractor. Um, some of them are not, uh, are zeroed out, but they're there as a reminder that it may be a cost uh, based on what you know about your site. For instance, you may decide that you need uh, soil borings. Um, if, we, if we didn't include it, you'll know that it's there. Um, the second category is installation costs. So this is kind of what you would expect to pay a contractor that you might hire. And um, uh, that that number includes all of the equipment that would be needed to create and install the um, array. So it's from showing up with a truck, uh, getting the array in place, uh, tested, uh, interconnected, working and talking to the utility, sending electricity back and forth, and the, and the contractor's gone. And beyond that is developer professional fees. Uh, these costs, depending on how you proceed with an array, might be either under your contractor, if you're doing like a design build sort of situation, or it could be under the school district if the school's uh, doing a, a professional consultant uh, and then bidding out the package. And then lastly, there's a small contingency in there, um, which uh, you can assume is going to be spent one way or the other, uh, but it's just our way of trying to help establish an appropriate budget. Next, next slide. With all of that uh, detailed uh, cost estimating, then we've created a 30 year lifespan financial performance. And so 30 years is a reasonable, uh, a common lifespan for uh, uh, owner, uh, array ownership uh, projection. Arrays will last um, most uh, um, warranties for array equipment go to 20 to 25 years. 25 years is becoming much more common these days, but sometimes it's 20 years. Uh, but we anticipate array performance beyond warranty level, and uh, 30 years is a reasonable uh, lifetime uh, estimate. There are arrays that I know of that are older than 30 years that are pushing 40 years. Uh, some are even older that are still functioning. Um, so 30 years is a reasonable life projection here. Um, we include in that an energy generation schedule on the far left-hand side you'll see, uh, which just tries to project out uh, energy uh, generated year by year over those 30 years. In the center, we have the potential revenue, which is basically how much might you save off of your utility. Um, as Ben talked about, we do have a little bit of a projected potential savings off of uh, demand charges. 
Um, and that's going to vary from site to site. Um, and it's just a portion. It is not going to eliminate. It may just mitigate a little bit of the demand charge. And then finally, we have a simplified cash flow projection. And that assumes a few things. We've got uh, in there an assumption that you uh, are taking out a loan, uh, but you do have about 20% cash down and you're taking out a loan for 80% uh, of the balance. Um, and the, that interest rate was uh, based on what was current at the time uh, interest rates. Of course, that may change uh, both now and into the future. We also have a good faith estimate of annual costs of ownership, um, things like insurance, uh, an estimate for insuring the array against damage. Of course, the array will have warranties for uh, panel failure or um, failure to perform against guaranteed minimums. But you know, uh, we want to make sure it's protected against uh, hail damage or whatever else might happen. And then there's also things like uh, uh, operation and maintenance uh, costs, which are typically minimal, but things like you know maybe keep cleaning the, the panels or double checking um, uh, electrical connections annually. Next slide, please. So uh, with all of that, um, it, it's all projected out uh, year by year and provides for you then a sense as to what the cash flow might look like on an annual basis, as well as uh, a cumulative cash flow. Um, we've tried to put in all the assumptions, uh, you know, make it uh, detailed so you can see uh, all of the numbers. Um, they're all good faith uh, assumptions. Some things may vary though, uh, ultimately, and uh, then you can see how they might carry through. Um, if, for instance, you find out that your insurance cost is uh, quite a bit less than what we think or more than what we think. Okay, next slide. Any, uh, I can pause for a second just to kind of see if there's any questions related to uh, project methodology for a second. Otherwise, we can, I can maybe just keep plumbing on. If you have any questions about project methodology, please feel free to, to send out a chat. Um, otherwise, maybe we, why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, and I'll start up the next section about what's in the report. And we can, we can definitely um, take questions here. So um, just a brief review of what's in the report. Next slide, please. So the report's divided into five sections, an introduction, understanding uh, this report, uh, the solar site uh, feasibility assessment itself, um, some recommendations for that site, and then additional information that we thought might be helpful for site owners. Next slide. So the introduction section includes an overall, overall uh, overview of the project and its uh, intent. Uh, kind of what we've talked about here, uh, funding sources that supported the, the project itself, uh, information about the uh, Montana Department of Environmental uh, Quality and the Energy Office, a little bit about ourselves, and then uh, a portion about understanding this uh, document. Next slide. So the um, the uh, understanding of this document tries to spell out all of the um, study documents that are included to help you understand what you're looking at when you see each of those components, uh, just so that, although I've rattled through it here today, uh, it's uh, in there for uh, posterity purposes. Let's try to help uh, explain what you're seeing when you're looking at the study. Next slide. So then the section with the solar feasibility uh, includes, as I've gone through, the uh, detailed site assessment, a preliminary concept um, with a, an indication of all of the materials um, that would be included in that array, how many panels, how many inverters, uh, optimizers, et cetera, um, the detailed cost estimate, and then the long range 30-year uh, financial performance. Uh, all that's included in the uh, assessment to give you a sense as to um, how that site might perform. And then a small summary that tries to summarize uh, what you're looking at. And, and I should pause here to say that um, on the assumptions, uh, an important assumption that we've made for any rooftop array is that the building itself is capable of handling a rooftop array. Now in the report, we do, do talk about how much weight you need, need to assume that is. Um, we tried to do our best uh, in terms of looking through satellite imagery, if we saw a building that gave us pause that we were not sure 
could handle an array, we would uh, we did try to find alternative options. Um, so if we're showing a rooftop array through our best uh, information available, we suspect that the building should be able to handle the array. But prior to proceeding with actually putting an array on a building, you'll want to make sure to do a structural assessment. Now, the structural assessment could be done by um, an array uh, a contractor. Uh, they can hire a structural to do that assessment and provide you that report, but it should be done before anybody actually uh, installed it on a roof. Next slide, please. So then lastly, we have a recommendation section that just tries to outline a number of recommended potential next steps that the school district can consider, things like a structural assessment or how to go about uh, procurement or exploring procurement. Next slide. And then lastly, we have additional information that uh, we think might be uh, good for uh, site owners. It's things like, uh, how does PV work? A little infographic there to explain how PV works. Um, an understanding of key solar concepts like net metering and renewable energy credits. Um, a review of project delivery options, how you might go about doing it. Uh, a little bit about peak shaving and demand charge concepts. Um, a little bit about utility load reduction. Um, some information about financing and incentives uh, that exist as well as links to additional resources. So we're just trying to give you a bundle of information that you might be able to draw upon. Okay. Next slide. So um, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, solar worksheet tool and then we'll see if there are any questions uh, briefly. Next slide. So in addition to the report, um, you will, if you haven't already, you will be receiving an Excel spreadsheet and this Excel spreadsheet is trying to uh, provide the same estimating tool that we used uh, to create the original report. We're trying to give you a, a tool that you can use to play around with bids that you might receive or numbers that you might receive from contractors. So um, the worksheet tool allows you to create the same kind of detailed 30-year financial projection, but you can uh, tweak the information uh, to test out different scenarios. So next slide, please. So that means um, first you can, um, the, the first page of the worksheet tool has uh, white cells, which are intended for you to fill in or test out different scenarios. And then tan cells, which are trying to give you information back. Please don't try to edit the tan cells. You, you shouldn't be able to, um, but uh, uh, next slide. What, uh, we have there is the first section is information about your array. So as you receive uh, proposals from a contractor, or if you wanna test out different scenarios, it allows you to indicate the array size, how many panels there are, um, um, what kind of um, warranties there are in terms of performance uh, year by year, uh, and how much is generated in that first year. Next slide, please. Uh, you can also then on the next section, uh, uh, put in information about your electrical use, so uh, who your electric utility is, but more importantly, what's your annual cons uh, electric consumption? What is your dem average annual demand? What are your costs for electric consumption and your costs for demand charge? Um, next slide. And then you can start uh, putting in information about uh, operations and maintenance costs. So we've got uh, uh, placeholders uh, from the report on what we believe is a reasonable um, dollar value for o &M, uh, costs. But as you get proposals from contractors, you can ask them specifically for numbers related to o &M. And also insurance, uh, you'll wanna talk to your insurance agent about um, what insuring the array may be. Uh, and those numbers are all flexible, so you can put in exactly what you're told from your contractor, your insurance agent. Next slide. And then uh, finally, uh, financial information. Whether you're thinking about putting some cash down on it, uh, if you look, if you have any grants or other no interest uh, funds, no um, obligation funds. And then uh, if you do have a loan, what percentage your loan or bond rate might be and how many years uh, that term is for, whether it's five years, six years, 10 years, 20 years, what have you. So as you enter in all that information, 
the report or the the uh, um, worksheet will report back to you um, the numbers that are resulting uh, from that. Okay, next slide. So uh, just any questions about any of the information that I've covered? Uh, we can take a pause, otherwise we can move on to Richard. Yeah, Ted, this is Ben. Uh, we had a question of whether uh, we could post the spreadsheet template. I replied in the chat that uh, we'll go ahead and post that template after the webinar. Um, we'll go ahead and post it to the Montana Solar Communities Project website, where if you're interested, you can also um, dig around and look at the report for each of the districts that were included in this feasibility study. Um, Again, that's the Montana Solar Communities Project website. Um, this is Robin. We had one other question. It says, uh, clarifying question about demand charges for the next pause. Um, how is demand calculated? Is it the maximum demand in any one instance, or is it in the cumulative maximum demand averaged over an hour or other time frame? That's a superb question, and it's going to vary a little bit from utility to utility exactly how they define demand charge. But typically, a demand charge is um, within the entire month. It is your 15 minutes um, of the highest instantaneous draw on the grid. And so you can think about it like, if, let's say you've got an, an end, a motor that uh, has it's a it's a five kilowatt motor if you run that motor for you know five minutes uh you're gonna only only gonna end up with so many kilowatt hours because you ran it for much less than an hour right so you're gonna end up with uh, a very small kilowatt hour usage but if you have 20 of those motors and they all kick on at once you've now got whatever uh, 100 kilowatts of instantaneous uh, energy demand and so the utilities have to make sure that they are uh, supplying your line with enough energy to meet that instantaneous demand. So that's the reason for the demand charge. Uh, buildings that typically are the higher energy uh, users in the community will typically be the, the uh, buildings that do have demand charges in their tariffs. Um, and as I say, so it's, the, it's an instantaneous measure, uh, typically a 15 minute window it can be based on a 24 hour period or a week or a month period. Um, and uh, that's, that's all kind of varies depending on how the utilities have put together their demand structures. Okay. So if there's no other questions now, we could uh, maybe uh, move on to the next slide and, and uh, Richard. It's actually going to be me. This is Robin. Thank you, Ted. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. So I'm just going to quickly go over um, some of the financing opportunities that were um, pointed out in the reports that were sent to the schools. Um, as outlined in the reports, the schools received there's a number of possible funding approaches, sources, and incentives. Um, some of these sources could significantly reduce the out-of-pocket costs for solar array and shorten financial payback. Um, interested schools should look into each of these financing options and incentives. Absolutely look into them. Um, I'm going to take just a few minutes to go over each of the funding opportunities. Um, first, we have the Alternative Energy Revolving Loan Program which comes out of the state of Montana, that's in the energy office here. Um, Miranda Bass is the program manager. She's also on the line. Um, if you have additional questions down the road, you're more than willing to reach it. You're more than, um, we're more than happy to help you. She can walk you through that. Um, the revolving loan program offers low interest loans up to $40,000 with repayment up to 10 years. Uh, these loans are for installing alternative energy systems and energy conservation measures may also be financed along with the alternative uh, energy project. Uh, next, we have the Northwestern Energy Universal System Benefit, uh, USB. It's important to note this funding is only available for um, Northwestern Energy customers. Um, oops, sorry. Up to 90% of project funding is available through the uh, E-Plus Renewable Energy Program. 
uh, for renewable energy. Let's see, I lost my. Peter frizzed out. There we go. Uh, up to 90% of project funding is available through the E plus renewable energy program for renewable energy installations on nonprofit or government and public buildings. Um, with this funding, uh, this is an incentive, not a grant, and the money is not given until the project has been complete. So next we have the Bonneville Environmental Foundation grants. These grants are generally only available to customers in areas that are served by electric co-ops and utilities that receive their wholesale power supply from Bonneville Power Administration or BPA. Um, Montana electric providers include Flathead, Missoula, Valley, Glacier, and Lincoln Electric Co-ops, Mission Valley Power, and City of Troy Power and Light. These grants cannot exceed more than 50% of the project cost. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, next, we have the energy performance contracting, which is a construction procurement method available to schools to yield cost savings from energy and water conservation by making upgrades to facilities. Um, the State Energy Office provides technical assistance for uh, EPC projects and review of the projects. You can also find a list of updated and pre-qualified energy performance contractors on your website or on our website. Um, which we can provide that for you if you need it. We also have the option of pursuing school district uh, revenue bonds, which of course are gonna differ from district to district. Um, and then last on the list is the State of Montana uh, Renewable Resource Grant and Loan Program, and that's with DNRC. Um, historically, this program has funded water projects, but it does offer grants for renewable energy projects for state, local, and tribal government entities. Um, we have the contact information for each of these funding programs and would be happy to share it if anyone's interested. Um, so if you are interested or if you have any further questions about this, please let us know either during the webinar or after. You can always reach out to any one of us and we can help you with that. So just that was a very quick overview, but if anyone has any questions, please let us know. Okay, sounds good. Um, next on the agenda, we have Rich Parker from the Bozeman School District. Rich is the Building Systems Energy Manager. Is going to share with us. He's going to share with us the overview of Bozeman Solar School Project. Good morning. Uh, uh, thanks for having me, Robin. Uh, see, is my video working? Yes. Uh, I was asked to. We just give a quick rundown on how we're making headway on uh, getting solar uh, arrays put into the school district. Uh, so next slide. This is uh, the discussion outline that we're going to do as the introduction of us, the approach of how we've been doing it, uh, how we've been achieving our goals, and then successes and challenges. And then a question and answer period. Next slide. Uh, a little about a little bit about me is uh, I am uh, an employee of the school district here in Bozeman. I'm a graduate of mechanical engineering at uh, Montana State University. And um, my previous life, I was riding in the uh, carrier that's in that picture. <laughs> I was a reactor operator for the U.S. Navy, and we used to consume a lot of energy instead of generate it. Next slide. So the, very similar to what Ted spoke of earlier, we, the, the approach that we would take is <clears throat> evaluate our building consumption. So we take a look at how much we're consuming uh, uh, the electric grid. Which is one major reason is to make sure that we don't put a solar array on that uh, will leave us with credits at the end of the year. So we, because we don't earn um, actual money back or any kind of financial uh, 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 
flood or a, a financial uh, credit, they disappear at the end of the year. So that's the first thing we wanted to do is make sure we don't generate too much. Uh, next slide. Then as a district, uh, we take a look at which buildings uh, could support a solar array uh, in regards to uh, where we want to put it, roof mount, uh, wall mount, pole mount, ground mount. Every one of them has pros and cons. We weigh them from building to building, and we try to implement the best cost-effective approach to getting them installed. Currently, um, we, that we are all roof mounted, uh, we are looking at um, pole mount and wall mount in the future. We uh, definitely want to look at installing uh, solar arrays on all new buildings uh, or new buildings coming up or having them ready. But uh, one idea I do like and I did in my own home is wall mount over south facing windows to minimize your solar gain in the summer. Uh, next slide. So uh, the, after we know uh, how much we consume and what we can support uh, size-wise, we go out and ask for estimates. Um, so the first thing we personally do is we hire an electrical engineer and a structural engineer to uh, evaluate the area that we've chosen to uh, put a solar array on. Um, we prefer this route. Uh, it, it gives us a, a, a sense of, of uh, comfort to have a stamped engineer designing the system to make sure that uh, something, as you see to the, in the picture, doesn't happen to us. Uh, that is MSU's uh, gymnasium complex. The roofs collapsed under a snow load. A uh, little caveat is that, that it was designed properly. It is an engineering school, but the uh, preventive maintenance in that or the, the deferred maintenance was one of the issues. Is the, Trusses were partially made of wood and the wood rot, so not a good thing. So we don't want that to happen, so we hire engineers to do it for us. Um, alternate approach for people who have a smaller budget uh, or can't afford to put that upfront cost. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, you could ask for a free estimate from your a installer that's uh, certified by your utility provider, just ensure that they uh, include the design review, the structural review, like Ted had said previously, um, so in the, in the future you don't have anything to worry about. Next slide. And then, um, uh, as Ted had mentioned, uh, return on investment calculations, you run through them to ensure that uh, you want to see what your your tip uh, breaking point is or tip over point is. When are you going to start making money to save yourself in energy costs? Um, make sure you include these items: uh, maintenance costs, the degradation of the output of the panels, and estimated labor costs for repairs. As Ted said, the uh, labor costs are pretty minimal, um, but they're they're there: repair costs and, and maintenance costs. And we also use PV watts to calculate what our rough estimate of generation is um, for the array that we've chosen based on our geographic location. Highly recommend utilizing that, web, that website and that calculator. Um, just as an example, um, our PV watts calculations on some of our arrays are around uh, 60 megawatt hours of generation for a year in our vicinity based on a 10 degree rack system ballasted on the roof. And right now we've only had one full year of uh, generation and we're about 15% behind that. So we might want to take that into account. And a lot of it had to do with snow uh, coverage and we're not going up there and sweeping them off. We, we kind of took that into account. Um, and then if the ROI calc support uh, the uh, looks like it's acceptable by our board. Uh, we'll move forward and start looking at funding the project. So next slide. And when it comes to funding, we uh, we do set aside capital project money uh, where when it's available to put towards our renewable um, system installation. 
along with that, we have had uh, we apply for grants on a regular basis from Northwestern Energy, the USD grant or uh, incentive program, uh, which has been very helpful. That is, uh, we've been receiving a fair amount of funding because we basically uh, we we have success in getting them put in, and I have a feeling that they appreciate that. So, uh, and also DEQ uh, had given us a grant uh, to fund the design of one of our solar arrays at Support Services, which was greatly appreciated. Next slide. So, and then finally, um, as a school district, we want to make sure we follow the procurement regulations for the state of Montana. There is the MCA or the Montana Code annotated that we utilize and we follow. Um, and you can also go to that website and start surfing through our Montana Code annotated to verify you're doing it correctly. And next slide. So some successes and challenges. Uh, our success is uh, currently we have two 50 kilowatt arrays that were installed together at the same time um, through a Northwestern uh, Energy USB grant. Um, we also had one installed, that what started the whole process was a student at Sacagawea Middle School, during our renovation of our middle school, they asked why are we not putting solar uh, systems up? Well, we had had the new wing designed to support uh, or be solar ready uh, or be solar uh, ready. And, um, the solar uh, the uh, solar ready wing. With then we were going to wait until we had the funding for a 50 kilowatt kilowatt array. Excuse me. And um, what what happened is the student basically went out and took the bull by the horns and got all, majority of it funded. It was pretty impressive. Um, they so that one was funded by. Uh, uh, funds raised by the community and students. And then we had a 50 kilowatt array put on the, our, our support services building, which is our most consumptive building in the district because that's where our food prep is and our food storage. So refrigeration is a, a lot of electricity. And then we have two more arrays going up. This summer, we received another USB grant, uh, 50 kilowatt arrays going on two more schools. And one of the pluses is, is that we have a cookie cutter school design. As you can see in the pictures, they're all the same design. And what helps with us with that is to reduce the overall structural review and electrical design side, because it's a basically copy and paste. Very similar structure, very similar construction, same architects, um, same engineers. So that helps in the cost reduction. Then we have uh, the first, uh, solar array that was put on in 1999 was a 2.3 kilowatt array from the USB grant funding back then and still running strong, so, so a good sign. Um, the other p positive is that we are currently not seeing um, too much of an effect by the tariffs that were threatened about six months ago. Uh, fingers crossed that it stays that way, and we continue to have pricing that continues to go down for installation or, or equipment um, purchases. And what's so great about this is we have uh, student groups that are really jumping on board uh, at a very young age, uh, showing interest in uh, renewable energy installations at the school districts. So it's pretty nice. They're going around and helping us with funding also. And then finally, all buildings and all new additions, anything that we build in the future, we're putting we're, one of our specs of that building design will be solar ready. So we rough in the electrical connections up to a preferred solar array installation location, and then we structurally build that wing or that, that building to support it based on assumptions on size and weight. So next slide. So uh, one of our uh, requirements when we put up our arrays is that we would like to have a graphical interface um, available to the students and staff of the building to be able to see how their system is performing. Because you don't know it's up there, uh, you don't see it, it's, it's a very uh, inanimate object, uh, 
we have required our solar inverters to be uh, web, web connected. So if you go to the next slide, you have a display similar to this, and it helps me with tracking on how they're performing um, and verify that our return on investment, you know, we're on a path to our return on investment estimations. And um, also, this is displayed on kiosks as you walk in most of the buildings. We still are implementing it in some, but that's kind of a, a, a nice thing for public ex exposure and public support. So if the public can see that we're reducing our consumption, in, in as an example, Highlight and Metal Arc schools were uh, approximately 25% less electrical consumption uh, is, is the estimate. We'll find out here shortly if that's where we're, how we're doing. Next slide. And then some of the challenges is uh, the limit of 50 kilowatt array. Um, that's something I wish I could, uh, I wish we could, we could fix because we definitely consume a heck of a lot more than what a 50 kilowatt array can generate in a year. The drawback is in the middle of the summer when we are not consuming much energy due to uh, school not being in session, um, we're producing the most at the time. So we, without using, if we, we have to have that net meter to, to collect those credits or that excess energy and then use it through the winter. Um, we are looking at options of possible uh, storage ideas and I'm constantly looking at options of how to do this and, and uh, uh, we'll see how it goes. Cost-wise, uh, battery storage just isn't there yet. Um, other challenges. Uh, working with our local authorities, having jurisdiction, uh, it, it's, I wouldn't say it's a new world, but we're, we have codes that have been changing regularly over the last five to ten years when it comes to safety, when it comes to fire protection, when it comes to um, solar array installations. And uh, that is changing fast enough to where some, um, some departments are not matching up to other departments. So we, we work with them to make sure we reach uh, the code compliant levels that we need to for our schools. And then making our return on investment numbers look good. And, you know, frankly, uh, because we don't have that tax incentive uh, or the tax breaks that uh, a, a private individual can have, uh, we can't apply those to our return on investment numbers and it just makes it extend it further. Right now, if we hope to hit, a, you know, seven to 10 years, but it'd be great if you could have a return on investment that was two to three years. Um, and then solar array designs and styles are uh, totally uh, changing and different approaches on how to route that energy from the module, from the panel down into your uh, grid connected system. So that's uh, staying on top of that is, 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 is interesting. So, um, next slide. So that's that's my presentation. Um, anybody, it, um, hopefully people know who that person is in that picture. Um, and uh, we'll open it up to questions. So it looks like we've got a couple of questions while you were talking. Um, one is from Madeline Quinlan. Thanks for your question, Madeline. Um, it says, do you have examples of schools that have used revenue bonds to fund solar panel projects. Um, I kind of touched base with some folks uh, while Rich was speaking. And at this time, we don't have a list, um, but I'm willing to look into that and see if we can't get that um, and provide those names, if there are any, to you. And let's see here. Uh, so from Ben, from a teacher's point of view, is there a graph that shows consumption consumption versus production? Uh, currently, we do not have a graph that does that. Uh, I am in the process process of submetering all of our buildings. And uh, once we have that ability to see what our total consumption is, uh, based especially demand metering. I, I really want to reduce our demands when possible because it's a substantial cost. Uh, but currently, no. Hopefully by the end of the summer, 
I will be able to have that data for you through our building management system. And then another question for you, Rich. Uh, what schools will have systems installed this summer and will they be roof mounted? That's for Madeline Quinlan as well. Uh, the schools that will have installations will be Emily and Morning Star, Emily Dickinson Elementary, Morning Star uh, Elementary. They are the cookie cutter schools. <laughs> uh, they were the first two that were built in 1992, um, and they'll, they're almost exactly the same. They, the design was just flipped on axis. So a wing goes off to the left as you walk in one building, and it goes off to the right as you walk into another. So there, um, hopefully that answers your question. And yes, they will be roof mounted. We prefer to do ballasted, uh, non-mechanical roof mounting. The uh, mechanical uh, fastening to flat roof membranes uh, scares us a little because of the increase in risk of roof leaks. So we prefer that we lay the systems on the membranes and ballast them appropriately and support, make sure the building supported. Okay, and then a question from Bill. Have you looked at EV bus adoption in system design? We have not. Uh, our buses are managed by a third party. We don't own our buses, uh, bus system, but we do wanna look into, we're always keeping an eye out for how we're gonna move forward with uh, uh, implementing um, electric vehicle in vehicles into the district. Um, I kind of trying to talk to um, show the return on investment numbers for a little Nissan Leaf to be our uh, office tool around car. <laughs> okay, and one other question for you, Rich, from Matt Thompson. Uh, what fringe benefits have you realized, such as greater energy awareness and support for other conservation initiatives? Uh, fringe benefits. Um, I, I guess uh, with our with our community being very uh, supportive of sustainable op, uh, processes, one of the fringe benefits is uh, it keeps our eyes, ours as a district, eyes open to other ways of saving energy uh, other than just renewables. Uh, for example, our school, um, new high school. If our thermal uh, calculations are correct, we'll be one of the most efficient buildings in the state. Uh, we are going to be doing um, a uh, ground source heating and cooling system for 310,000 square feet. And, and it, it, you know, if we weren't aware of that uh, or keeping that as a high priority uh, when it comes to design and operation of our schools, um, that would not have been a benefit. A building may have been built to minimum code compliance, but in this case, we're, we, we, we build our structures to, to perform very well. Um, so, and we have, we have uh, a lot of data from 1999 to now of how our buildings have performed uh, through the uh, Energy Star program. Uh, we have a portfolio that we're constantly monitoring. I hope that answers your question, Matt. Uh, if I may, I may pop in also on, with a couple of thoughts on both the EV as well as from a teacher perspective. Uh, one thing you guys can be aware of is that it's uh, um, very common or uh, possible to put together a, an information kiosk in a public space like a school's lobby or uh, some place that's uh, well accessed where you can track uh, performance of an array on a minute by, by minute basis, which can be really pretty cool for a school. And the other thing that I'll throw out uh, related to EV, um, as you think about applying solar to buildings as well as other functions like uh, EV charging, uh, keep in mind your uh, whatever net metering cap you are uh, on uh, because, uh, uh, and then talk with your utility about whether they apply that 
by meter or by premise, and if it's by premise, how they define premise, um, because you can design where you put charging stations, perhaps to um, be able to put it in, a, in a, on a site that you're not currently having a solar array, which would enable you to do two solar arrays. Um, so just you want to design in where you uh, put your solar arrays to feed what sorts of systems so that you can maximize your benefit um, while still staying within the net metering cap that you are under, if that makes sense. Sorry, I was muted. Rich, there's another question for you. Um, could you please explain your bid selection process and construction manage management strategy for solar installs? Sure, I can definitely do that. So in, in the current process, we do a design bid build uh, we have our uh, engineers on contract uh, come up with the design, come up with the spec, come up with the construction drawings. Um, we have, uh, once we have that, we go through the procurement process per the state, uh, which is we'll advertise for two, uh, two weeks um, and then public advertisement, and then we'll request uh, bids. For that, in that advertisement, we're requesting for bids for the system design. We'll do a system walkthrough or a, or a project walkthrough prior, a pre bid walkthrough. Take the questions from the pre bid walkthrough, put them uh, to the engineers to answer um, that are coming from the people interested in the installation. We come out with addenda as needed to cover the questions, and then we have a bid opening. The bid opening occurs. Um, uh, it, usually in our office nowadays, <laughs> uh, electronically. And uh, then we take the, we verify that the uh, lowest bidder meets all the requirements of the design. We have the engineers verify that, and then we're off and running. Um, we build a schedule from there. And usually in our, well, not usually, our, our project will have a schedule with a uh, end date in, in mind. Right. Hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions for Rich? Um, I think I was muted when I was explaining this a minute ago, but um, we have some time to open the floor for questions for any, but any of the presenters or any of the topics at this point. Um, we did notice that there were some call-ins, people that aren't on the webinar. So we wanna give them an opportunity as well if you want to unmute yourself and ask any questions, um, we'll give you that opportunity to do so now. Um, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll go ahead and answer those for you. Robin, this has been Brower. I just want to jump back in as people are thinking of any last question. Um, just, to, just to follow up on these presentations, thank you, Rich and Ted and Robin for covering all this good material. Um, and just want to reiterate for the schools that um, that received or were participating in the solar feasibility studies, um, as I'm sure you're well aware, we didn't give you blueprints for um, going out and building a solar array on your roof, um, but hopefully it's enough information for you to, to start the conversation inside of your school district, analyze whether, um, whether it's feasible. Um, and um, um, if you do choose to, to reach out to a solar installation business, um, then you, you have a basis of, of uh, what to look for and a basis of potential cost. Again, um, cost estimates are estimates, um, and uh, we do expect that you're going to do your own due diligence in terms of your electrical and structural analysis and your own, um, your own fiduciary analysis as to whether, um, whether you're going to be able to realize the savings that, uh, that the system might project. If you have questions in the course of going through this process, um, feel free to reach out to us in our office um, and hopefully help to answer your questions, if not put you in touch with the right people who could. That's all I wanted to add. Um, if there were any other questions, we can go ahead and field those now. Looks like there's um, another question from Madeline. Uh, what is the status of federal funding for the Montana solar community? Thanks, uh, Madeline. The 
that project wrapped up at the end of 2019. Um, so we no longer have funding through that project available. Um, it was a one-time grant. Um, and, uh, and, and so we're not anticipating that that project will continue to receive funding. Um, the resources that we developed through that project, as I mentioned, are posted at the Montana Solar Community Project website um, and hopefully will continue to be of use. If we receive additional funds through you know, DOE or, or another source um, along a similar vein, then, um, then we'll be reaching back out to folks, but we don't anticipate a similar project at this time. Just a reminder to everyone too, Ben and I's information is, is posted up right now for contact information, but we also have contact information for everything, for anyone that was discussed in our presentations, um, even the list of schools that were funded, um, if you're interested. Um, so be sure to let us know if you need any of that contact information or um, any of the web addresses to find out more information. Any other questions? Anyone on the phone like to answer, ask any questions? Okay. Well, thank you, thank you everybody for joining in and a special thanks to um, Rich and Ted for presenting along with us today. I think it was a really good webinar. I hope everyone else thought so and please feel free to give us any feedback as well. Ben, is there anything you'd like to add? No, thanks all for joining us and uh, yep, have, an, have a good day. Thank, Thank you, you for organizing this. Have a good day. You too.